Welcome to the Buildology Podcast. I'm Perry. I'm Randy. I'm Matt. I'm Justin. We're going to help you become a Buildologist. Perry, Randy, Mac, and Justin have a combined 100 plus years of experience in the building and real estate industry. And now they bestow that experience to you to help you become Buildologists. This is the Buildology Podcast. We've got building down to a science. I can't do it. Okay. We'll do it live. Okay. We'll do it live. Do it live. I can. I'll write it and we'll do it live. This thing sucks. Uh, hey guys. <laughs> How's everybody doing this evening? <laughs> doing good. Good. Good, good. Doing good. Doing good. Well, welcome to the first live Buildology podcast number five. Number five. So it took us four to figure out that editing stuff it takes a long time and uh, a couple of uh, crashed video files and stuff like that to figure <laughs> out, man... That's a that's a lot of work. Let's figure out how this live thing works and see if uh, or, or to be brave enough to go live. Yeah, yeah. brave yeah. enough to go live. Yeah, so and, exactly. And we're very thankful that you're flying this plane because <laughs> Perry and I we'd be nose in. We right would have now. crashed and burned already a long time ago. Yeah. Long time ago. So we're we're gonna try a couple things out. So this is a uh, just a camera view of uh, Mac and me, and this is all of us. And then there's Perry, and unfortunately, Randy got tied up in a meeting and isn't going to be able to join us this uh, evening. So maybe he's maybe he's one of our live viewers out there. <laughs> so he could be. He's the, actually the only one in the group that's actually out making money right now. Yeah, yeah that's exactly. Right. That's, that's an important point. thing. So th this is uh, fun time, not <laughs> not money time. So <laughs> we, we do have fun doing this. That's for sure. No doubt. No Absolutely. doubt we do. Yeah. So um, I'm going to be a little bit of a mission controller in this episode right here and in future episodes. So when it comes to topics, I'll try to, um, you know, kind of guide everyone in the topics and then if people that are listening in if they reach out into the chat and give us a question here and there um, we can basically ask the experts at this point um, so we've we're running live into Facebook and to YouTube uh, simultaneously a simulcast so um, we'll get chat from both sides of it and I will have to probably moderate the chat from one side to the other because we may get um, more questions that if you're in Facebook, you won't be able to see the YouTube question. So I'll try to repeat the question um, just so everyone that's tuning in can see, hey, where, where'd that one from left field come from? I mean, it wouldn't be past me to throw a question out from left field, but uh, maybe I can throw the person's name into it so we can identify who yeah, it I'm was. Looking, I'm, I'm looking at the comments right now, too. I want to thank all uh, four, four of our friends and family <laughs> members. Yeah, yeah, this came in. So this is definitely the, uh, te the test pilot episode of this, so episode five. So this is going to be how we do it in the future. So um, you know, every Wednesday at 5.30 until the time changes, this will be the you know same bat time and same bat place. So um, you, you you guys out there watching the future unfold before it, your eyes. Yeah, this is it. Yeah, and there is like a thirty second delay. So if you type a question, we get it a little bit quicker than our answer. So um, just know that we promise we're, we're not we're, slow. We're, like we're, we're, well, I don't know if we're slow. Or not, but <laughs> well, we, we've definitely got to be quick on our feet, though. We've yeah. got to be able to answer mm. questions on the fly, which exactly. we can do. We do it every day. Yeah, That's what so we do every good, day. good point. Good point. So then, why don't we uh, kind of pick up since we did have a little technical issue of getting the episode four out? We were probably about a week behind, and you know, as the moderator of that, that's. Uh, I, I think we were a little late in getting that. And so there's not a lot of people that saw all the topics on episode four. And so maybe we could kind of pick up where we left off over there. And one of the topics that we started episode four off that I think we could do a whole master class on was that CMA report. And I, we, we kind of, if you haven't tuned in too much, that we, we have this naming uh, thing going on that we keep coming up with things that need definitive names. One of them is the cat in the background. We haven't defined that name. We've got a couple of good names. Uh, Einstein, Houston. Um, someone gave me, there was a, in episode four, one of the first, or maybe it was three, there was a pretty good cat name in there. Uh, the other one is the CMA. Is it a community market analysis? Is it a competitive market analysis? And okay. now I got from North Texas, a realtor sent me one and called it a comparable or compatible. 
however you want to call it. Okay. Market analysis. Yeah. Wow. So I don't know. No, no, I, no, no. CMA. I don't know. CMA. We just call yeah. it CMA. CMA. We does. just call it. A, everyone calls it a CMA. <laughs> the actual definition of it, but the intent is basically comparing, uh, you know, your product, yeah. your house, to the market. Yeah. It's yeah. really sh- the it's the they shorten it to say you're getting comps. Right. C-O-M-P-S. Right. So yeah. getting a comp. Comparables. Right. Okay. And we yeah. got one comment that says comparable market analysis. And, and okay. Well, that's, that's that's what the that's gentleman. A, from listen, that's one more vote than we had last week. So right. we, we have a winner. Yeah. Oh, we, we, have have a winner. A, we have a we winner. Have a winner. <laughs> we didn't ever announce the prize, but. <laughs> and, and that's what the gentleman from North Texas said in the email to me last night was okay. comparable market okay. analysis. All right. All right. We have some very educated, knowledgeable listeners out there right now. We do. Yeah, yeah, we do. We do. So um, last week, we kind of took a deep dive on a, a report that you ran. And in this right. week, you kind of um, pre-show were expressing to Mac and I some ideas on another thing that you saw yeah, that it went was, back to episode one. It was amazing mm-hmm. that last week we talked about two homes on the same street. They were $50,000 apart, and that was only six months apart in the sale. I found yesterday, I was looking at another one in the Houston area, and found the exact same house listed twice, same address, same square footage. Everything was I- exactly identical. It sold one in February, one in September, and it sold for $50,000 more. Wow. Within the same year, the same wow. home. Yeah. Wow. So again, if you're just using that average sales price yeah. and that's it, you're leaving money on the table. Yeah. Look at the area, look at the market, look at everything. But that I, also says a lot about what kind of market we're in right now. Oh, absolutely. If yeah, you ever thought crazy. about selling a house or refinancing a house or yeah. pulling equity out of a home, now's the time to do it. Yeah, yeah. we'll explain some of those um, factors a little later in the show. Uh, Max got some you know, good information on that, and I do as a kind of like cherry on top of the topic, but uh, your point right now the time is now um to to do that yeah if you ever thought about and i know mac mentioned something earlier today about interest rates and so forth well interest rates are low and at the same time the values are very high so if you want to pull some home some equity out of your home and you want to be able to do a refinance whatever you're doing now's a good time to do it yeah and what i'm seeing out there right now is there's so much fear out there that's driving this market right Uh, just super high demand Properties are flying off the shelf, you know, as soon as they're listed and people are afraid that rates are going to go up and all that supply and demand imbalance is driving pricing through the roof right now, especially in new homes. And it's very likely interest rates will go up because they're at an all time yeah. low. They can right. only they can't really go down no, lower. No, they can right. only go up. But even going up a point is still very insignificant compared to where we are today. Right. True. Yeah. Very that, true. That's a good point. So, you know, in a hot market like we're in right now uh, versus a down market um, with high interest rates. I think the number one assumption is that houses don't sell in down markets and they fly off the shelves in hot markets. And the reality is that in the down markets, houses sell too. People just usually aren't as attuned they attuned to things as they are in hot markets. Right. You know, right. the, everyone thinks in a down market, oh, my house can't yeah. sell. It's not worth anything. You know, uh, we talked about last week kind of, in the uh, 2008, 2009, everyone thought, well, they can't sell a house. Yeah, it's going to hang out on the market. doesn't mean it's not worth anything. Right. Um, and there's just less buyers in the market. And then right now, there's a bunch of buyers in the market. And so there's a, a lot of factors you know, driving those buyers to the market. Right. And I can tell you that from a national perspective, an expert perspective, not me being the expert, but having bought reports that show how long this trend should last, all the experts are expecting five years. Because of the shortage of lots we talked about before in one of the other episodes, there's about a five-year run ahead of us. Okay. So you, you should be good as far as increasing sales prices. Uh, interest rates should stay low, and the market should stay strong for about five years. Now, does it make sense to buy the home now? It's, it, it's really a, a crapshoot. Yeah. Right. yeah. One of the big factors in that is, is cost going up. And you know, if Randy was here, I think he would kind of second the, the motion on this, the, the in the building side of it, what we're seeing, not just in lumber is like just skyrocketing and, and, and it's a commodity product product. So it's going up and down It's traded every day on the commodity market. So the price fluctuates, but it's hovering at all time high price ranges, but it's not just lumber. It's everything. So, um, sheet goods, appliances, everything is getting higher. Yeah. And that kind of gets into, um, you know, a topic I'll just talk about it a little bit later as we talk about inflation 
and what what's coming what's contributing to that and cheap money contributes to that and if you have a bunch of cheap loans that are coming into the market so it's cheap to get money so there's more money in the market it's going to drive prices up and so as costs go up and money is accessible and there's more buyers in the market things go up and so <clears throat> i think in our industry people don't really understand that they they see the consumer price index and then it stays really really flat but what we have is is an asset in real estate and it follows a different curve than the consumer it's not like gas or something like that it follows a completely different curve and I, I see a lot of people get confused on that and they're like well inflation what are you talking about the gas is the same price as it was last year or the year before that no they're they're measured on two different scales so um we are seeing inflation. You can't inject a couple billion dollars into our economy and not see signs of inflation, especially in assets. Mm. And so I think we're starting to see that now. You got buyers in the market, you got, you know, rising costs. Your dollar is not going as far as it used to go. Yeah. So that that is inflation. And so it's important to also educate people on the difference between affl- inflation and appreciation. Because even in a, a really bad neighborhood right now, you, like you're talking about, uh, there's run a CMA on, you know, a, a historically, you know, non price appreciating neighborhood and you'll see prices going up. Well, that market is just inflating, right? So appreciation is the amount of money after inflation. And so some markets right now in a hot market are just, you know, skyrocketing. Right. Right. And so um, as you see, it, it is different, that community market analysis, one community versus an another, if you're in a desirable area, that area is appreciating. And some places are just inflating. Right. And, and so and time is money. And we all know it takes longer to build a home today. And so if you're working with a builder and he tells you he can build a home in four or five months, even yeah. six months, right. he, he, he would have had to already order appliances yeah. to deliver that timeline. Yeah, all that has changed even in the last few months. Absolutely. It's really, really changed. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah, there's a lot of builders out there that are not even releasing, um, you know, they're not releasing specs. They're they're holding it until, you know, if you want something on the ground, it's going to be sold. And so that has, uh, you know, just doing that alone with withdraws supply into the market. It's already a very, very tight market. Right. I mean, there's not a lot of inventory on the ground. And because costs are so high, it forces them to hold back that spec start. So it doesn't inject that house into the market for someone to buy. Right. And now you're you're not increasing the supply you're, because the cost side is so expensive. You're pulling supply back and, and it gets a it's a really, really strange dynamic thing that's happening right now. And speaking of, of strange dynamics, you know, we've we witnessed kind of a double-edged sword for a lot of home builders out there right now in the fact that, yes, all this crazy demand that's out there right now is driving sales. I mean, right. sales are through the roof. Right. But on the other side of that coin, if you're a builder and you're trying to lock in pricing for materials and even labor to some extent, um, you know, it's taking much longer to get through the entire front end part of the process. And if you lock a customer's price in yeah. and you're not starting that home for four months, right? a lot of exposure for lot, that building. A lot of exposure. So yeah. We're, yeah. I'm not sure where this is all going to end up. Even trying to meet with the city to get permits done. Some cities are still not open because of COVID. They're, right. they're working from home. Yeah. We're taking problem. at least twice as long. You can't walk into the office and get a permit anymore. No. No. You have to send them in. You have to wait. Yeah, and the, it takes time. The and, process and slowed down for sure. And I don't care what they say. I know with so many people that are working from home right now, um, you know, they it, with, with everybody out there... It, productivity has gone down. I mean, most folks that are working from home going, no, I'm just as productive as I always was. But I don't really think that's the case. I mean, let's face it. I can't tell you the number of times I sit here looking at the cat behind me. I have two cats in my house and JJ looks a lot like this. And when I'm in a meeting on a Zoom call, yeah. it's like he is drawn to the camera. He's over my shoulder looking at the camera the whole time. It's hard to be productive when you've got a little uh, Siamese cat looking uh, at you. Absolutely. Exactly. absolutely. Yeah. I'm kind of the same we have a cat too and as i'm working and he just has to walk across the laptop like you they, commented they, you said i yeah. like the tail yeah it's just, just like just, just back and forth yeah 
Yeah, well, I'm fascinated here. I'm looking at the uh, at questions coming across here. So I want to encourage everybody out there if you if you're watching and uh, yeah, throw us a comment in the chat. A, just uh, just exercise and make sure that it's uh, working. So uh, the guys running the controls here know how to respond to chat and ask a question. And hopefully <laughs> it's a question on topic, but if not, maybe we'll address those too. So we can you could even, questions. you can even message us and ask Perry to raise his right arm. We'll <laughs> yeah, see if you exactly. can make us all but dance I, up here. But I think it's his left arm. <laughs> <laughs> in this. I think it's backwards. I don't so, know. Speaking of which, I, can we mention our first sponsor the, that we talked about? Well, probably not yet, but <laughs> we do have someone wanting to sponsor the show. And I think, uh, we're going to save that for later. We'll save that one it's for later. pretty exciting. Yeah, it is super it exciting. It is exciting. Yeah. yeah. The product's uh, the super exciting. If you're a guy, I think it's super exciting. Yeah. So yeah. <laughs> it's very male-oriented. <laughs> so, um, Mac, you wanted to kind of bring up some uh, interest rate um, discussion. And yeah. I think our conversation with CMA, inflation, and stuff like that kind of yeah. leads right into that. Yeah. Since um, interest rates are the mechanism that um, the government tries to, you know, leverage and control inflation um, yeah. right now being an all time low. Well, the problem is, is that, you know, we, we've all gotten spoiled as consumers. You know, everybody's sitting out there right now. Uh, how long has it been for rates being down in the single digits? I mean, it's been what? It, at least a year and a half, two years. I mean, I don't remember well, the last time they were double it's, digits. It's, it's, it's been that. much longer than that, actually. Yeah, I yeah. Mean, it's been a, it's been a while. I can't remember how long it's been since yeah. we had double digit interest yeah. interest rates. Yeah, and really, uh, as I look at kind of the overall economy and see, um, you've got injecting a bunch of money into the economy, which is inflationary, but at the same time, you have record unemployment, <clears throat> which is deflationary. So the it, government really is in a tricky situation. What they, they always try to do is keep, it, uh, keep us in balance, right? And interest rates are that tool of doing that. And two biggest deflationary things would be unemployment and technology. So technology coming in and, say, automating your bank. And will you, I won't throw out a specific bank, but as you go into a bank, there's less tellers and there's more ATM machines, right? So that's a job that's not there. So technology tends to remove jobs from the market, which is a deflationary thing. And so injecting cash into the economy, inflationary, and then the interest rates are, are a measure of that. So now, as you've got record low interest rates that are trying to get buyers into the market, make money easy to get, um, not easy to get, but more available uh, to more people. So that's bringing people in. And so as the asset of real estate um, inflates, that doesn't mean that there isn't deflationary things out there right now at record levels. Like we've never, you know, since the 20s uh, seen unemployment this high, but it's it's removing jobs out of the market, um, some of which might not come back because of automation, um, self-driving cars, things like that. As that technology, think of something like that as it's going to remove people out of the workforce. Um, there's not going to be as many truck drivers getting into the field of trucking because automation is right around the corner. Within five years, trucks are going to be driving themselves. There might be local delivery guys that need to maybe unhook the trailer and back it up to the, you know, dock or something. Right. But the freeways right. will be littered with self-driving and um, it, all that stuff happens on an S curve. And I think in coronavirus, everyone's kind of familiar with what an S curve is. Yeah. You know, it looks yeah. like it's not happening and until all of a sudden it is happening and you're like, wait a minute, I'm surrounded by this, you know? So um, automation like that is going to have, that, but that's a deflationary thing. So um, you just got to be, real cognizant of those things in the marketplace that as they um, affect you, you know, uh, in, in real estate, it affects everyone because you got all kinds of different price points of jobs of, you know, just because right now houses are flying off the market, it's definitely, you know, houses today um, are getting more and more unaffordable, right? So that entry level buyer into a house it's getting further getting away out. Yeah. and, and right. that's bringing the the rental market up correct everything is inflating a rising tide floating all boats that's right. what we're seeing out there right now you know what to answer your question i just thought i was reviewing like earlier this week looking at uh, a relative's house payment 
and their house, I think they've been living in the house 15, maybe 20 years, yeah. was 6%. Yeah. Oh, so to wow. put that in perspective, 15 years ago it was 6%. Yeah. It's, that's how long it's been under double digits. I know yeah. you and I talked about it 35 years ago. Yeah. We sold yeah. homes at 18%. It was in the 80s, yeah. yeah the in 18%, the 80s, 18%. The, uh, back in the days of the neutron mortgage. Right. Yeah, destroy now, the buyer, leave the home intact. What is it today? Is it three? It's under four. It's three. I'm sure we've got someone out there that can type in the comment section. Somebody's going to need to tell us. As a matter of fact, I asked uh, one of my good friends that is actually the owner of a local mortgage company and. Uh, on my way over here, I asked him, I said, is there anything that, uh, that you'd like me to share with the folks out there today? And he said, yeah, he said, anyone that's out there, whether they're, you know, um, a, a buyer looking for land, a uh, buyer looking for new homes, uh, an investor looking for a new project, his advice was be ready. Be yeah. ready with everything because there is so much demand. When you find that property, you need to be ready to pull the trigger have your loan pre-approved, have all your T's crossed, your yeah. I's dotted, well, and, and all your ducks in a, in a yeah. row. Yeah. In a wing Randy wing. said last week that in order to go to an open house in his community, you had to have pre-approval for yeah. mortgage company. Oh, yeah. And so just to get on, get in the lane. So we got a line. comment in, in the YouTube uh, text there that it was three give or take, so okay. around 3%. So yeah, okay. makes sense. Yeah. yeah, yeah, giving, you know, so many he, circumstances that involve that, that three is a roundabout number. So. Sound like maybe somebody that's in the mortgage industry out <laughs> yeah, there. Yeah, exactly. That. We yeah. appreciate that. Yeah, Thank we you. appreciate Absolutely. it. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. But that makes good sense. I mean, think about it. 15 years ago, it was 6%. Yeah. Now it's a 3%. So if it right. goes up, if it ticks up a little bit, it's right. okay. Don't panic. Right. right. Yeah, There's I mean, no even, to. you know, the old... Golly, I'm I'm trying to think. We we said that, so I'm thinking twenty ooh, twenty four years ago, something in that time frame when it was around seven seven and a half percent, and I can remember doing equations at about seven and a half percent that rent versus own type of formula to where it, if it starts crossing seven and a half, you start flooding the market with renters. Um, versus people buying just because of the yeah. um, the math behind it. So I think you have all the way up until that. It, I'd have to dust off some of those old formulas that um, I used to do. I'm sure someone out there would probably correct me at some point that it's like 6.8 or something like that. But it, um, as I recall, it was, it was in the sevens that at some point right there you cross that well, threshold. You think about it, you've got two elements working. You've got sales prices increasing. So that has the same effect right. as the interest rates going up. And right. we know the prices are increasing because right. material costs are going right. up. Right. And, then you, and then in addition to that, you add to it the flood of millennials in the market that are not looking to live in right. the suburbs anymore. And they want to rent. They want to be in downtown. They want to live next to the restaurants and the bars and so forth. And that's what's driving the rental market that you're seeing. Yeah. Well, and, and it's interesting, Perry, that you brought that up because I was actually flipping through some of my real estate magazines, uh, my realtor magazines this morning, and I was really surprised by a statistic about the millennials. You know, the conventional wisdom is is that, you know, like, like you said, that they're um, more interested in renting and leasing than, than owning. And... What's really wild, especially in the local market here, the numbers actually contradict that. Is that right? That's yeah, great. Yeah, and I've, I've, I brought that magazine with me. I can show you that later. But uh, it seems that the COVID thing has yeah. really changed the dynamic. I think a lot of millennials, and speak up millennials, you're out there. <laughs> yeah. so, That's right. Uh, tell me if I'm wrong on this. But, you know, a lot of millennials now that might have been content prior to COVID to renting or leasing, now they're like, you know, heck, let's get out of the city. Let's get out yeah. in the country a little bit. Uh, even out in, in some of the build on your lot deals that I'm seeing, I'm seeing a lot more millennials that are coming out to get away from all that. Yeah. You know, they want some room to spread out. And I think they're seeing maybe the benefit of home ownership while these rates are ridiculously low. Well, that could have a significant shift in the market because the millennials are exactly. now the largest population segment in the world. Yeah. And I think and that with the COVID situation, I think that shift in the millennial uh, mindset has really continued to drive yeah. everything up. Yeah. Yeah. I think anytime you inject a bunch of buyers into a market with all the other pressures into the market of cost, right. low interest rates. So that's bringing, um, people that were already in the market 
that that's going to make the decision for them. Now's the time. And then um, as population grows, um, that's another factor. So um, kind of the underlying thing that I don't think a lot of people understand in real estate is that what we're dealing with is a scarce resource. It's land. There's, I've looked this fact up n- not too long ago, but there's like 2.4 billion acres in the United States. There's not anymore unless we, you know, take over and I don't know, Hawaii grows a, <laughs> a little more, but it won't be in our lifetime. So we're kind of stuck at this scarce resource. And, you know, what you're buying is a scarce resource. And what's going up is the land. You know, the land is increasing. And what you're trying to do as a homeowner is not make the asset on top of it depreciate. (laughs) You're trying to uh, keep that asset in good shape and make sure that the appreciation in the land is going up and that you don't, you know, that means you got to repaint millennials and you got to, you know, caulk some things and, you know, take care of it. You just can't drive it into the ground because if you do drive it into the ground, you will be some of the people that sees depreciating real estate. And right. I get that comment all the time. We're like, well, my neighborhood didn't get up, uh, didn't go up in value. And I'm like, well, I know why, because the neighborhood didn't take care of itself. It went down the, you got to look at buying a house is the thing on top of the land can depreciate just like your car. Sure it can. Right. Yep. But what masks it is the land value going up, you know, right. back in the, 50s and 60s, we used to, you know, you can go back into any old part of town and see half acre lots with little tiny houses on them. Right. Right. Those are all getting torn down and carved up in five or six lots. So the land value is what's going up. The house on top is not the thing that went up. It's the land that's going up. And so you got to do your job to keep that asset, you know, tip top shape. You want to sell your car for max value. You're going to get it clean, make sure the glass isn't broken, change the tires. You're going to do all the stuff to get top dollar for it. Right. But it's still just a thing at the end of the day. That car is it, it, it's not a scarce resource. So the scarce resource of the land is what the is land, going The up. land remains. The land remains. Yeah. Yeah. And pride, pride and ownership. That's what yeah. they look yeah. for. I, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. I look like we have a uh, question. Okay. What is, okay. What is the best way to win a builder's business as a loan officer? Great question. That is a good question. Yeah. So, um, I have a question. I have an answer that I think would be right. So I'm going to let, why don't we all take a stab at it? So, okay. okay. So um, we'll start with Perry. So okay. let me ask it again. What is the best way for, uh, to win a builder's business as a loan officer? And, and I want to thank Brandon for, for posing that question because okay. we appreciate it. You know, the biggest thing that a builder looks for from a loan officer is honesty. Yeah. Because, we tend to take their word for it and start building a home with the anticipation that this particular buyer is going to purchase it. So if they are on top of their game and they're keeping everything up to date and the records are right and they're giving us honest input, they can't disclose anything financially about the buyer. But if there is an issue, just keep us abreast of what's going on so we can make decisions on the home based upon the input they're giving us. Right, yeah. So um, I think... Mac and I are going to agree on, on this one. I, 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 I've known Mac long enough that I, I almost know the answer he's going to give. I might and, surprise and, you. And, and at this point, I'm not sure if it's my answer or Mac's answer. As I ask okay. we we'll collaborate but, uh, on this one. We'll collaborate on this one. So um, it's relationship. It comes down to relationship. And so... Amen, brother. It is 100%. So I'm going to ask you to remove yourself and, and just... This business that we are in is 100% a relationship business. And it doesn't matter if you're trying to sell a builder, a loan, a a range, a two by four, or whatever it is. The person that the builder deals with, irregardless of company, okay? So I've had plenty of reps and it doesn't matter what the company is. I do business with that company or that entity because of my rep or my person that I interact with. And anything that you could do to build that relationship is what is going to make that experience between the two of you stronger because we deal with a commodity market, right? So money is a commodity, right? Anyone's offering money. And that's a difficult situation when you're a loan officer or or a bank or you know, a private investor or something like that, all you're offering someone is a commodity. Well, we also deal with commodities. Lumber is a commodity. 
Concrete is a commodity. Sheetrock is a commodity. Like all these things are bought and traded, you know, uh, as commodities every single day. But it's not the commodity that's important. It's the relationship and the, the name behind that, whatever it is. And so to build that relationship is asking yourself, what can I do to build value in that relationship with that builder? How can I gain him value? So asking that builder what you need to make his day easier, and I'm sure the answer is going to be closing a loan, you know, closing a sale quicker, putting money into that, that builder's pocket quicker. How can you do that? How can you use your relationship to do that? And you said before, Mac, it's a people business. It's always been, always will be. Yeah. And, and mm. yes, you do know me pretty well. Justin, so <laughs> take the words right out of my mouth. Yeah. So, but, but, you know, and, and if I'm going to be totally, totally honest and answer Brandon's question mm-hmm. on that, I would have to say this is to all you LOs, to all your loan officers out there. Um, it is still, you can, and again, I agree with everything that you said, mm-hmm. Justin, but I'm going to add a little bit to that. Okay. Um, to all the, the loan officers out there, I think it's very important. You need to talk to, <laughs> to management and make sure that you've got the products that are competitive because yeah. at the end of the day, yes, what do I expect from a loan officer? I expect honesty, integrity, knowledge, um, service. Those are the, the, the big ones. But I have had, and I hate to say this, but it's the truth. I've had customers that have had less than stellar service with certain lenders, yeah. but they had a more competitive product. Yeah. And sometimes the dollar yeah. wins. And that's sad. It, it shouldn't sad. be that way, but that's yeah. the reality yeah. of it. And that's kind of like, um, you know, a, as a builder or a real estate agent or investor or anyone in this industry, right, you have to be aware of what, what the competition's doing. And True. be aware, like, hey, this is what a competitive rate is at this deal. And so you are offering a commodity. But how can you deliver that commodity with a little bit more service? Because we're still a service-oriented business. True. Right? So you got to deliver it with some additional service. And what I mean by that is, you know, let's say you get a builder to commit to you. Don't ask for all of his business. And let me just try the next deal right? Let me see how I can perform on the very next deal. Let, give me a shot to perform, right? Right. Earn the business, right? Yeah. So n- no builder is going to say, okay, well, if you take the time to, you know, get in front of them, all the steps that you had to get, and now you've got a one-on-one sales situation. Now it's just you and them, right? You and them. So it's sales 101. How can I get from here to close? And that's going to be building that relationship yep. and delivering something that they need. Yep. They can also help educate the buyers because yeah. let's face it, they're the mortgage experts. The yeah. loan officers are, so they can create flyers that show the down payments required. They can show the different loan types. They can show the monthly payments. They can help explain that. They can help host mm-hmm. open houses. They yeah. can be there to answer questions. Oh, yeah, that's a great one. Cause I've had many loan officers um, when you're doing an open house or um, you got a new community that needs coverage or something like that. A uh, loan officer there is sometimes 10 times better than a salesperson Absolutely. because they have all the answers that that's the buyer's next step is they may have already made the mind. I'm, I'm going to live here. The next question is, can I afford it? Right. And if you've got a loan officer that is there that can capture that business and partnering with real estate agents, uh, partnering with builders that way and going in and say, Hey, I'm willing to staff that house um, this weekend, pick up some, cause you're essentially, if you sell the house, right? Help sell the house. You're getting the business. You're going to get the it. business. You're right. going to get the business. Cause right? that buyer that came in that bought the home is going to want you to represent is, them. Right. Yeah, exactly. Absolutely. Yeah. They want you in this transaction and you're going to answer all their questions yeah. and stuff. That, that's a fantastic. And that's, uh, and that's always been the, been the case in any kind of sales. I mean, basically a loan officer is a salesperson. Right. And, um, you know, people always, it goes back to people. Yeah. People always do business with people that they like and that they trust. Yeah. And, and you said this early on about what's in it for me. Yeah. So the buyer comes in and their biggest concern is cost or monthly payment or whatever right. it might be. Yeah. If you have an expert there to help you at that yeah. time, you've got credibility. Abs- yeah. Absolutely. Because yeah, a lot of times that like 
you the the sale like in real estate you know it's location 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 right a lot of times if you're talking you're a builder and you put a spec on the ground or you got a neighborhood or something like that the minute they walked into that product they've answered so many questions they've they've whittled it down they've pretty much with today's internet they've researched the schools they, they're coming in really really educated as a buyer right that at that point in time so if you have someone that is educated on the financial side of it that's the last place that the buyer is educated on is the financial side they know where they want to live and they know you know if they're it's down to two or three builders in this small area they're evaluating that and i i, I can many times i can see where they would pick the loan officer in that situation but they might not pick that house they might pick the one across the street or something like that but it, they formed that relationship answered all the questions and now they delivered some value to that client and the next three or four might work with that builder and that's so, the key right. they, they're a value added component yeah true having a knowledgeable true. person and especially yeah. the lower price points it depends on the product itself right. lower price points are huge when it comes to the mortgage market good right. good point and i get a lot of feedback from my customers that are you know always ask me and say you know do you guys have any preferred lenders which of course we do and we've vetted them and they've vetted us and uh and it's not always just the loan officer a lot yeah. of times it's the processor oh yeah the process the team it's yeah. the back office folks that can yeah. make or break a loan officer right. which can also make or break a mortgage company so yeah. those are the things that a lot of people don't think about i've, I've had plenty of, of uh, experiences with some really great loan officers over the years uh, but for one reason or another they had a, a back office team uh, yeah. processors that just couldn't make everything happen and who takes the fall for that it's yeah. the loan officer yeah i've seen that a lot in in almost any industry let's say you have a really really strong rep for whatever you know money mm -hmm. lumber you know she yeah. wrote wh whatever All it is right above. and then the company fails behind them and because it is a relationship business i i find people doing business with a rep and not necessarily the company because the rep is so strong that they're covering a lot of issues with the company and that for any reason that they you change reps or that connection to the company that person's gone instantly because the the right. company behind it wasn't strong enough to keep you mm -hmm. as a client so that that's kind of hits back to that question that uh, what can you do is really just gauging the builders uh, commitment you know, wh what is their satisfaction, not just to that loan officer, but you say, Mac, just a couple steps back. So you get a couple yeah. steps back. What, what was their, you know, what was it like going through that process? You know, and if I could, this is a little bit of a change of, uh -huh. of pace here, but yeah. one of the things that is going to be the biggest issue to be dealt with in the future is appraisals. Oh, yeah. Because you think about the price We've increases. Done that. We talked about the house that went up fifty thousand dollars in six months on the same yeah. street and so forth. They're the same mm -hmm. house selling twice for fifty thousand dollars more. How are they going to get the appraised values? Yeah, that's going to be a challenge. So we saw that, um, you know, before the recession. So let's go back to two thousand and five. Super hot market. You know, you could build a pink house upside down and it would sell, right? Mm -hmm. And it'd probably have backup offers. Yeah. So I it, saw that one. Yeah, I saw that I remember one. Seeing yeah. that one yeah. I think it was on one of those <laughs> DIY shows. <laughs> <laughs> one of those guys was walking it. He was like, what the heck is going on here? The, uh, upside down pink <laughs> was, house show. Yeah, the upside down pink <laughs> house show. I'm not that was touching a, that one. It was, no, a, that one it was a hot market house there, right? <laughs> Some of and those then, exist today. Some of those exist today. I think John Mellencamp wrote a song about that, actually. So. <laughs> you know, you had the hot market. And then um, with all the stuff that happened in the lending market, one of the, th uh, and really it was investors coming in and people took advantage of appraisals and that whole system that was going on there because appraisals were getting um, shot way above the price range and people were coming in. They, they were monkeying deals around because they were really supposed to have 20% down, but because they monkeyed the appraisal around, it was really a hundred percent loan. And you know, all that had to get weeded out of the market. So then um, fast forward to like 2009, when you could, you know, be a surgeon and have a perfect credit score. And because the house didn't appraise, they're not giving you the loan. They're, they're like, nope, sorry, not for you. And we're like, yes. wait a minute. Um, yeah. What do you mean it didn't appraise? They just didn't want to make the loan because it didn't appraise. 
But then put it in perspective today. I've, I've had people tell me I only offered 35000 over asking price, and, yeah. I, and I got beat out. Right. Yep. So how is that home in Austin? Good example is in Austin. I know a builder is getting 70000 over asking price. How are the, co- the comparables, comparables, whatever they may be? So here's something I'll tell you from a uh, building perspective that previous to the Great Depression and home building, right, um, there was a lot more co-op between builders and cash deals to appraisers than there is now. This whole system that they have for appraising now, um, it's really kind of like drive by, take a picture, look at MLS. I can't tell you the last time that I had ever been asked like, hey, let me see your cash deals that you've done or the off market stuff that you've done. See, they used to go grab all that stuff. And now it's just what's in MLS. Well, MLS, people think MLS is the whole market. MLS is not the whole market by far. And there is simply too much business out there and too few appraisers. Yeah, I mean, too free, yeah and that's exactly. not just in the Houston market, but all over the all over the country. Yeah, so it's not a real measure. Uh, MLS is is an is a picture. It's like a statistical picture, but it is when it comes down to a neighborhood, especially like a new neighborhood, a hot, a changing neighborhood that's going up in price right? You get cash buyers that come in and, and buy it cash. And then that never is reflected as a sale anywhere that someone can just pull up an MLS and say, Oh, there, there's a sale and there's a comp. Well, there could be a comp right down the street. And if it was cash, it never hit the, it never hit the market and it'll never show up. And how do you as a buyer convince that the seller is like, now he's got an appraisal that's six months old. Well, six months ago, that might've been the price, but not now. Not today. Not as today. We, as we said earlier, a house, same house, the exact same home yeah. sold, and six months later, fifty thousand. So here, here's increase. the sad thing. So if you're selling a house, right, you're and it's a hot market, and that buyer wants to come in and doesn't appraise, well, you just got to be a stronger buyer because he's he's got someone else that he can sell the house to, and if you wait too long, he's going to make more money. <laughs> so, well, and that goes back to what my mortgage buddy told me this morning. Yeah. He was like, you know, he said, hey, just. Everybody out there, be prepared. If you're getting ready to buy something, be ready. Yeah, you you might you yeah. might have thought you were going to put ten percent down, but now you have to put twenty just to cover the have, difference. Have plan but B. See, you bring up a good point place. because this is something the market doesn't understand. Mm-hmm. The appraised value is not the sales price. No, the appraised value is what the mortgage lender will loan you on the home. Oh, I, I can't tell you uh, like how many times there years ago. Um, I can't remember if it was the just the builder's contract that you know the the form that's out there was a Trek contract. One of those contracts in there had a checkbox about sales price and with a appraised value versus that. That's right. And I had this guy one time he was asking me he was like, "Well, can we do it on appraised value?" I said, "Well, yeah, are you going to pay me more if it uh, comes in 20, 30,000 dollars more?" than what I'm asking. And he was like, "Well, no." And I'm like, "Well, I'm not going to pay you. I'm not going to sell it for less." Right. If it comes in the opposite way. so But in the buyer's mind and in the market, they believe that the appraised value determines the sales price and that is completely detached. And, and, and it's kind of like uh, opinions. We could get five appraisers and they would come up with five different prices. That's exactly right. And so um, you can just take that as guidance. And what, what I explain that an appraisal is to people is an amount that the bank will feel comfortable lending with. There it is. It's it defines the loan value. That, that's that, it. That's it. Does the not, loan value. It, the has loan value has nothing to do with the sales price. And that and that yeah. is the purpose of the appraisal is to really kind of protect the loan value, the bank, to yeah. give the the lender yes. some idea of value. Right. right. And yeah. so they can measure are they over leveraged or not, and right. you know they're they're measuring risk, and that's a that's a factor for them to measure risk. So in the market, in a you know everything being equal in a, in a fair competitive market, would a buyer and a seller get together and you guys agree on the price? Guess what? That's the price. That's right. right. And what that means (laughs) to the buyers, what that means to the people listening is they may have to have more cash available for the down payment. If they're offering 35,000 over asking price to get the contract. And if it won't appraise, they have to make up the difference with cash. Right. So be prepared. Just as you said, be prepared. That's, that's the ticket. And again, really appreciate uh, that question from Brandon. Thank you again. Good job. Okay, so we got another one. Market is wild. People had better be over their rifle eye on the target. Safety off and starting to squeeze the trigger or they aren't ready to buy. 
That's that's that's, that's pretty much what we've been <laughs> talking that's about. A, that's a, exactly exactly true. Yeah. And here in Texas, we are seeing uh, most contracts with easy ten to twenty percent over asking price, no seller con- uh, concessions, and they are waiving their appraisal addendums. Yeah, that, that's you know right. Right up exactly what we're seeing is it's an ever-changing market right now. And to be honest, the, the factors, as we do research for the show right here, I tried to project, do I see an end to it? And I don't see factors uh, ending this. I see it now continuing on this trend. And, you know, do you call that a bubble? I don't know yet. It, um, it's the availability of product. Right. That's the difference. When you think about 2008, when the market burst and the bubble popped, right. there yeah. was too much product too on much. the market. Well, we Today, don't have it. There's no, no inventory. The exact, there's no product. And here's the thing about it, though, so is the last, th- this is the thing that I don't think a lot of people get um, is probably deep insight into our industry. And you brought it up on, I think, Perry, on episode two or three, is that the last recession killed development. Exactly. It, that's and and we're, we're here we are talking about land, so a, a scarce resource. Well, well you just took development out of the right. mix. So put it in perspective. As I said on episode two, there were fifty thousand homes a year, new new homes being built in Houston, Texas. In two thousand eight, it dropped down below ten thousand. Right. So even at a forty thousand home development yeah. Yeah. deficit, it took. Until 2012, so it took four years yeah. to even get back above to get close to 20,000 homes a year. There's still a deficit. That's why the experts are suggesting that we're five years, at a minimum, five years behind, yeah. even beginning to plateau on a lot of availability. But the lending side, um, so what drives this? So let's back it up to the land side of it, right? So before the recession, you had... Um, Think of the business model that existed around. So there were big, large developers that sold retail lots and builders and developers literally lived in separate worlds, right? They, it's You're a builder, you went to the developer and you, you were, did that. You were at the mercy of the developer. Right. And what now works? because of that last crunch, builders are developers now, right? Yeah. So they're having to put their own, um, their own capital, their own capital into, into the deal. So yeah. is you know, even the big ones, they're taking capital and putting it in to put land on the ground. It changed the whole land aspect of how land gets put into the market, and it doesn't come at the same rate right? A, but a, as, it, as it used to. There's an interesting dynamic going on right now, though, is the fact that uh, many of the big box builders that also happen to be developers that are buying these large tracts of raw land uh, there is a trend now that I'm seeing with these big box builders that are limiting sales only to inventory that they choose to start. Yeah, They're no longer, and this has been in the last couple of months, they're no longer allowing their salespeople to have their buyers pick out a lot, pick out the home, right. pick out the elevation and all that. Right. Not happening. It's the, not happening. They're actually, in some markets, offering a lottery to sign up and it takes a year until you then have the opportunity to then choose a lot. Yeah. And at that point, the home is priced. Right. And if you don't want it, somebody else can have it. And even worse, yeah. I've heard this in starter home markets, they have land grab days. Oh, no. Yes, <laughs> where they line people up and they blow a whistle and they run to the lot they want to buy. Oh, is that man. crazy? That's, that's a reality Oakland, show. Oakland. Coming up. Yeah. It is, it is yeah. a reality Stay show, tuned. but I've heard this many times from different sources at different places around Texas. Yeah, yeah we're going to have the HGTV show where they hand them a steak and they say, go go find it. <laughs> Your lot, you got a cul de sac <laughs> lot, you better run. <laughs> is that amazing? <laughs> great, <laughs> the great gold rush. Yeah. But no, it's really, I mean, there's a lot of risk out there right now. A lot of the builders, I mean, I had a customer ask me the other day, they were telling me about one of their kids that experienced this, that, yeah. you know, the, the larger builder would not allow them to pick out their own lot. Uh, and that had changed, you know, w- within a couple of weeks from them talking to him. Wow. Anyway, the bottom line was, is that, um, that, um, you know, they, they went out there and said, Hey, we really don't have any choice, but the builder explained it to him. said, look, you know, we, we build 10,000 homes a year nationwide. And if the rates do go up, if something happens with the interest rate, suddenly we could see a 20, 30, 40% fallout of the current customers on the books. And then guess what? 
They got a whole bunch of standing inventories there. Yeah. Around. Yeah. But That's I think always even, and that definitely happens, yeah, no doubt. But yeah. today, I think the reason it's happening is because they don't know what the cost of the home is going to be. And that is another good part. And so what they do is they say, we will price it when it hits a certain stage or at a later date. And that's what they're doing today. And they're saying you can only sell so many at a time because they can't control the cost and how long it's going to take to start the home. Yeah. Right. Right. So, guys, I mean, the three of us, you put us with some microphones, some headphones. I think we could go on forever and, um, you know, out of respect of everyone's time. I think uh, for our first live episode, I think it was pretty good. Um, I, I mean, We'll uh, get it out there to the world in the recorded version and kind of let it go in the YouTube world and um, let the viewers have it. But uh, what do you what do you think for a live format? I liked it. I'm comfortable with it, it. And I'm glad yeah. to see people are calling in. We want to know what people yeah. want to hear about because yeah. we don't want to bore people. We want to know yeah. be sure what would you like to, for us to speak on? And right. it's, a, it's a lot more fun when the customers come out there and they say, hey, look, you know, we're interested in this. Tell us about this. Share your experience. So yeah. we appreciate it. Yeah, as, as, as we grow it, um, the channel and, and reach new people and new things, I think yeah. this is a pretty good format that um, we, we can really – you know, sit around and share our knowledge, um, you know, because th that's what really led me to the idea. I mean, you put four guys around the table. Unfortunately, Randy's not here on the first one, but uh, around the table, we're going to be able to answer some questions. So, and, and throughout the week, they can go on to the podcast and leave yeah. comments yeah. And, and tell exactly. us what future subjects yep. we need yeah. to talk yeah. about. Yeah, so. and the, the last thing we put out there, uh, someone's got to name the cat. I mean, we're, we're the next one, I think we're coming on. I'm, I'm going to have to print a T-shirt for the winner of the cat name. And then I think on the back we'll put all the names for CMA. <laughs> the Perfect. And I, and I think I remember the other one. I think it was Puma Furman. P Puma Thurman. That Puma was it. Puma Thurman. Thurman. Furman. Puma Furman. Oh, Puma Furman. Puma yes. Furman. <laughs> okay. So, uh, you know, just in case anyone in the very beginning missed it, I think I'm going to run our little thing before as we sign out here. So a little treat at the end. We'll just uh, our little Bill O'Reilly uh, take. But uh, are we going to sing or what are we going to no, do? We're, we're no, we're not going to sing. We're definitely not going to sing. None of us. No one wants us to sing. They, they, they'll all tune out super quick, quickly, super quick. quick. Now, I say that. Randy has actually got a pretty strong voice. No, Randy, he yeah, he's a rock and roll guy. Yeah, he, he is does. a rock and roll guy. He's so still, he still is a member of a band, isn't he? He he still, I think, performs. Uh, yeah, I, I don't yeah. know. So, <laughs> so uh, he's not here. He's to not tell here. Us, so he's we not can, here. Yeah. We don't know. In our minds, he's a rock star, yeah, right? That's right. <laughs> I, think he's, I think he's touring with Aerosmith. Though. That's there what he is. He's oh, touring yeah. right now. That's what. Yeah. That's what he's doing. So. <laughs> Okay, guys, uh, we'll sign out from there, and uh, we'll leave everyone kind of with our little uh, tidbit from the beginning in case you missed it. So, everyone, thanks for tuning in, and here's a something. I can't do it. Okay. We'll do it live. Okay. We'll, no. we'll do it live. <laughs> do it live. I can, I'll write it, and we'll do it live. <laughs> Thing sucks.